We've been looking uh, at the first topic, the very, the very best place to start in the book of Proverbs, and that is what? What is the topic that he delights in and things that he doesn't delight in? We saw that he loves four things we saw. He loves righteous living, our actions. He loves pure thoughts and words. He loves acceptable worship and prayer. And God loves honest dealing. Remember the weight, the just weight. Some of you remember that? You, you with? It was up here. You remember that? All right. The just weight and balance, that was also the night that the basement flooded. You, okay, some of you remember that. All right. Uh, tonight we are going to, to, to go to the other half of that and look specifically at some traits and deeds that displease the Lord. We looked at the positive side. Now let's look at the negative side. And uh, there are all kinds of verses that we could go to. But again, I remind you, if verses come to your mind in the book of Proverbs, you say, why is he not using that verse for that topic? We will get to that verse eventually under another subpoint, probably. But I want to clarify something tonight before we start. And you got to get it. Because this probably will help you with your uh, interpretation of Scripture and as you read through things, as you think through things. And here it is. Tonight we're going to look at something that is an abomination to the Lord. We learned that the word abomination is a very strong word. A, a synonym of abomination is what? Yeah, disgusting. Something that is disgusting to the Lord. But I want you to understand something that as you read passages like this that talk about an abomination, we're going to see a character trait that is an abomination to the Lord. You need to understand something concerning the New Testament believer, concerning believers, concerning the salvation that we have, that a child of God is never disgusting to the Lord. Okay? But here's the problem. We, need, we see verses like this, and we see traits like this, and we need to understand them in the view or through the glasses of New Testament sanctification, which means that we are changing every day into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has declared us perfectly righteous and impossibility of being disgusting to Him. However, sometimes Christians act disgusting. One guy realizes it about his own life. Sometimes, sometimes Christians act like they are unsaved. And when you see verses, like we'll see verses about tonight, about what is an abomination, a displeasure of the Lord, the way that a New Testament believer interprets those passages are through the glasses of New Testament sanctification. That is, that is I must not act like the unsaved. I must not act and do those things that disgusts the Lord, realizing you're under the blood. I don't want any Christian to go away from here and say, hey, that applied to me. I'm disgusting to God. I'm an abomination to God. The blood of Jesus Christ covers you, but you must not act like he has changed you, what he has changed you from. Is everybody on the, the right page with me? Same page. Okay, very good. The first thing tonight we want to look at that is something that greatly displeases the Lord is a proud heart or a proud attitude. A proud heart or pr proud attitude. There are so many verses in Proverbs I could, could go to. But tonight, there's a wealth of infor information surrounding one verse of Scripture. Turn to Proverbs 16, verse number 5. Proverbs 16, verse number 5. We will stay on this verse and we'll work off of this verse tonight. And I think that when you go away, that if you seriously listen, you'll be blessed. Proverbs 16, verse number 5 says this, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he, that's the proud man, shall not be unpunished. You notice the, the verse starts out with the first two words yelled out. What are they? Everyone. 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 You know, everyone, some think that their pride is a very small thing in comparison to the great deeds that they do for God. For instance, they think that if they're a big shot in the kingdom of God, a big shot in the church, a big, big shot as far as someone that they, that they consider themselves spiritual, that a little bit of pride is no big deal. But I want you to notice that this word is all-inclusive, everyone. I want you to notice here that uh, being uh, someone that is even greatly used of the Lord is no license to have a proud heart. And I say this because something came to my mind as I studied this. What came to my heart is, is that sometimes when people are greatly used from the, by the Lord, whether it be a, a, a spiritual leader in a church, or whether it be a pastor, or whether it be a deacon, or whether it be a missionary, I've met some that think that they are big shots because God is using them, so that gives them a license to have pride. But I want you to notice that the Bible says that everyone that hath a proud heart is an abomination of the Lord. 
God doesn't allow a license for anyone to be proud about themselves. In fact, there are no big shots in the family of God. There are no big shots in the family of God. Everyone in the body of Christ has been given gifts that are necessary and useful. And uh, you know the passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians. We've covered it many times about different parts, about different members. It, it, let, let's say it this way. It's not that one person is a big shot in the family of God. Everyone is a big shot in the family of God. Everyone who is saved is a child of God and is very necessary. But no matter how much God uses you, you better not get a proud heart. Doesn't matter how many souls you win to Jesus Christ or how many visitors you can bring to church or, or how great your ministry is growing at Lighthouse Baptist Church or, or how influential you are, you ought not get a, a big heart, a, a proud heart about it. We see here the word abomination again, and we've already talked about it. A synonym for that is, is disgusting. An abomination, that's a strong word. A proud heart is disgusting to the Lord. You know, the problem though with teaching on a proud heart is that the people who really need the message have a, a, a proud heart and they can't see their sin in the area because they see themselves as always right. Okay, let me say that again. The problem with preaching or teaching on a proud heart is the people who really need it are not the people who are convicted. The people who are convicted are the people who are humble people willing to receive instruction. But the people who really need it write it off and say, I don't have that problem. Okay? You know, it's kind of like the guy who says, I'm very humble, you just ask me. You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of that kind of thing. You know, so I'd like to carefully, if you allow me, to insert the precious two-edged sword uh, into your hearts tonight and so that you would see this area and hopefully I will cut through the thoughts and the intents of your heart by the Word of God. If you allow that to happen, then we'll come away from here changed. How can you tell if you have the proud heart of Proverbs chapter 16 and verse number 5? Obviously, it disgusts the Lord. God is not interested in it. God doesn't want you to have it. He doesn't want you to act like an unsaved person. He doesn't want you to act like what you were when you were an abomination before you were saved. How can you tell? How's it revealed? There's many revelations, but I want to introduce you tonight to four men. If you look at your sheet, please. There are four men. These are the actual men of Scripture. I traveled back uh, and took photographs of these men. So if you wonder if these are the actual ones in the verses, they are. And uh, you'll notice there's four men here, and there's four revelations of their life that show that they had a proud heart. They're different aspects. You can directly apply them. First revelation of whether you have a proud heart or not to be revealed to you. Listen to God's Word. A proud heart is revealed when you don't give glory or don't give the credit of your successes in your life to the Lord. Okay? It reveals if you are a sponge with credit, if you are a sponge with praise uh, of wanting to take the glory for your achievements, for things that you do, small or great, that it reveals that you have a proud heart. If you'll look at Acts chapter 12 and 21 through 24 on your sheet, you're welcome to look, at, look it up in the scripture. I just did it this way to be a little quicker tonight. The Bible says in Acts 12, 21, And upon a set day Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Herod is a king. He is a powerful man. He is making an oration to the people. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately... The angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not, you see that phrase? He gave not glory, the glory, excuse me, he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. You look at that and you think, here's a man, he's a powerful man. He probably has great talents and abilities. His oration, he was probably a man that kept people's attention. Very exciting, very dynamic. He obviously was a loved ruler of the day. The people scream out the voice of a God. The problem is that Herod didn't do anything. He allowed them to praise him without deflecting the glory to the Lord. The story is straightforward and clear. He makes a speech, people praise him. He doesn't acknowledge or tell the people that God is the one who made him what he is. He doesn't say, God made me to be your king. He doesn't say, God made me to have a voice to be able to, to be a good orator. He doesn't say, God made me rich. God put me where I am. Praise the Lord. Doesn't say it at all. 
You say, I'm not a king, yet all the time you receive probably thanks. Some of you are godly people and you try to be a blessing to other people. You receive uh, uh, thanks and you receive glory and you receive praise. What do you do with it? Do you just soak it up like a sponge or do you de deflect it to the glory of God? All right, the Bible says it's a serious thing for a man to rob God of his glory. I mean, frankly, these folks, I don't know about these worms, but I don't want to try it. You know, the Bible says that he was eaten of, I don't know what that means, but I don't know, I don't think I want to know what it means. All right? I don't know if God put some, okay, graphic, God put some, uh, some uh, of these uh, uh, jungle type worms that, you know, can eat different things, just created them in his stomach, and he, they, I don't know what happened, but I know it's true. I know what happened is true. Please understand, God does not like the fact that when we rob his, his glory and praise from him by accepting uh, it in, an, in and of ourselves. The point is when we begin thinking, when you begin thinking that you deserve some credit for some great thing that you do, or you think that you are responsible for your own successes, you have a proud heart. It's a revelation of a proud heart. Herod thought, look at me! It's about time that that uh, first worm took a bite out of his heart or his large intestine or whatever was he was eaten. Okay. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 7, a verse that I love, a great verse if you're working on your humility. The Bible says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? The idea, if you have a talent, why are you glorying? God gave it to you. It was something given to you. You, don't, you. you didn't do anything to get it. If you can sing well, it's not because you made your voice chords or whatever. If you can play well an instrument or if you can uh, do something with your hands physically or if you have great intelligence, you, do you think that you created your IQ? It's God deflected to Him. To Him be all the glory. All right? It should not be a meaningless habit, but a heartfelt deflection of pride when people praise you to say, praise the Lord, or to say, uh, God gave me these abilities, not me. Learn to say that. Learn to say it from the heart. I don't have, I can't, and if you need to elaborate on it, elaborate it. Teach that person something. Oh, man, you are so good. Man, I appreciate whatever. Teach that person spiritually. Love them and say, you know, I don't have anything but what I received of the Lord. I love what one pastor said about his ministry. He said, you know, the things around here that you see that are good, God did those things. And those, the things around here that you see are pretty poor, that's what I did. Okay? I like that. I think that's a great way to, to live life. We should not expect praise or be disappointed when it does not come. If you stand around waiting for somebody to praise you for something you did, it reveals that you have a proud heart. You're not really doing it for the Lord. You're doing it for the pat on the back, aren't you? Yeah, but so often we're like that. Number two, the second revelation of a proud heart, again, coming right from Proverbs 16, verse number five. We're working off of this verse, the springboard verse. But the second is, second revelation of a proud heart is when you get angry because you don't get the attention or the respect you think you deserve. This is a little different nuance than the first one. When you don't get the attention, you know, when little kids, uh, when you have children and, and one of them gets left out of something, you know how they are. You know, they start pouting. They start, they, they want to all mommy's attention and, and what about me and I didn't get the same bike that Johnny got and, and I try to teach my kids that life is absolutely not fair at all, okay? But the thing is that sometimes as adults we act this exact same way. You know, when we don't get attention or we don't get the respect that we think that we deserve, then we start pouting about it. <laughs> Nobody looked at me. Nobody did this. Look at 2 Kings 5, verse 10 through 13. The Bible says, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. This is Naaman, the captain of the Syrian host, saying, remember he, was a, he got leprosy. Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. What was, what was his problem? What was Naaman's problem? Well, you've got to understand who Naaman was. He was a captain, the, the captain of all the hosts of Syria. 
He was an important man. When, Pete, when he walked through a crowd, the crowd parted and probably bowed to him in his country. So he's got this little maid uh, from Israel that was probably a bond servant that tells his, her, him that there is a, a, a prophet, Elisha, in Israel that could cure him. So he goes to this prophet. Oh, he probably has a big, uh, you know, a big embassage of, of men around him. And he goes to his house and, you know, he's, you know, he's there in all his pomp and circumstances. Elisha won't even come to the door. He sends his servant out. I think Elisha realized, you know, who, who cares about this captain and the host of Syria? I work for God, you know, I work for the Lord God. So he, he goes out, and what is wrong is it doesn't happen the way Naaman thought it should happen. There's no respect. There's no, as he, he says what he thought should happen, this great, this man of God should come out, oh, great Naaman of Syria, and call on, and make this huge circumstance, maybe wave his wand a couple times, smoke, and fire. He expected this great thing, because he was a great man. Didn't happen at all. Elisha's servant comes out and said, go wash, and, and he tells him to go wash in the Jordan, a muddy river that is despicable to a Syrian, and he even says, man, we've got these great rivers. You want me to go in that muddy stream? It was not, what was his problem? He had a huge head. And it didn't happen the way he thought it should happen. He didn't get the attention. He didn't get the respect. And he's outraged because he thought there would be a grand show of healing him. He was further humiliated from that having to dip in Jordan. Listen to me, if no one treats you special and, and you're not held in high respect somewhere, do you get angry? Do you go away and say, don't, don't want to even talk to me? <laughs> Nobody recognized me. You know? Pastors never called on me to pray in church. <laughs> I, I, I never get asked to do anything big. You know? It shows a proud heart. It shows a heart that's not willing to be a servant like the Lord Jesus Christ taking a bowl and washing disciples' feet. But rather you want to be the one that people, whose feet people wash. You would rather be up on top. Do you get angry when you don't get recognized for your accomplishments or no one notices that you have done something for the Lord? So, of course, you have to tell them that you made that meal or that you did something for that poor person or whatever. You ever had a person like that? I don't want to make fun, but you ever had a person like that that, that, that feels the need to share with you all the things that they've done? Well, I haven't told anybody else, but, you know, I did this and this and this, you know. Or, uh, you know, I was over there doing this and over there, you know that. Okay, listen. Listen, folks, the things that we ought to do, we ought to do just for the Lord. And if nobody knows that, all the better. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. You know, do it for the Lord. Do it for the praise and glory of the Lord. If I praise you here, you have your reward. You know, that's what Scripture says. Jesus praises those that, that do things quietly and give their alms in secret, not uh, so that everyone can know about it. I appreciate so much the, the, the heart of this fellow who gave towards the missions house who said, I absolutely don't want anybody to know about that. And I said, that'll be just fine. That'll be perfect. And he has right spirit. You know, he's going to get rewards in heaven because his name's not mentioned and there's no plaque anywhere and we haven't named the staircase after him down there or anything like that. All right. Okay, do you have to be the center of attention or do you pout if you're left out of being the center of attention? Uh, it's a proud heart that is trouble when you don't get enough respect or attention that you think you need. This was Haman's sin also in Esther chapter 3. You remember as he walked through the crowd and everybody's bowing to him and, oh, big Haman. He's got his chest out there. I'm a big, I'm a big fella. I'm a big fella. And there's Mordecai. He's just a godly man. Mordecai says, I'm bowing to nobody but the Lord. And Haman says, you bow to me. Haman tries to exterminate all the Jews and ends up in the same gallows that he tried to hang Mordecai on. Listen, don't be a Haman. Don't be a Naaman. Don't have a proud heart that wants attention all the time. There's a third revelation of whether you have a proud heart. Do you show off your possessions? Uh-oh. Show off your possessions. I, you say, Pastor, I don't have any possessions. Isaiah 39, verse number 1. Verse number one, Isaiah 39, verse number one. And by the way, if your car is older than 25 years old, you do not qualify for this, uh, for this category. It's just a little joke. 39, one says, at that time, there's a big name there. Moradak, that fella, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Look up here a moment. Remember, Hezekiah asked for more time. God granted him more time. 
king of Babylon, sends ambassadors to him to give him a present. They come and look what he does. And Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, and the spices, the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah, the prophet unto king Hezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are from afar. They are come from a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then said he, What have they seen? in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the day is come, that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. What was the Lord's judgment for? A proud heart. It, it was because this man wanted to show everybody what he had. He wanted to, Hezekiah wanted to uh, be really something that when these guys went back to Babylon, they would say, wow, that king of Israel, Hezekiah, he's got a lot of stuff. In verse number two, there's a, there's a classic statement. Notice verse number two, what it says there. It says, uh, Isaiah 39, two on your sheet. It says, and Hezekiah was glad of them and showed them the house of his, what are the next two words? Precious Can you see them? These are my precious things. Some of us act that way about our, whatever, our house, or our car, or our motorcycle. It's getting a little close now for <laughs> conviction. Or, you know, or our, this, my landscaping, or my, they're my precious things. Did you see my Rolex watch? Did you see, they're my precious things. It's a classic statement. And that's what Hezekiah, this is all that he had. What a proud heart. What's the point? God has graciously given you everything that you have. All right, it is not appropriate at all. For a child of God who's been given things, to pridefully show it off. God gave it to you. You say, Pastor, but I show it off and I say, look what God gave me. And look what God gave me here. And look at this, what God gave me here. Okay, listen, folks, you can definitely do that. And that's just a bunch of words. All right? All right? Please understand that if God gave you something, praise the Lord for it. The Bible says He gives us all things richly to enjoy. The Bible says that there is not any problem with being rich. He tells me as a pastor to communicate to you, to share that wealth, whatever. Uh, but if it's not your position to frustrate or even to put a stumbling block in front of a poorer Christian by making them jealous or making them walk away and say, well, God must not be blessing me in my life. You know, it's great for you if God has given you a beautiful house or whatever, you share that to the glory of God. You share that with missionaries that come through. You share that with other people. You have them over. You be hospital to butter. But when they come over, don't you say, look at my empire! Okay? My heart was greatly touched by someone that is here tonight. I'm not going to mention who it is at all. Several years ago, I went to their house. And uh, I, one of the first things, you know, to be social, it's, it's the polite thing to do. You know, it was a beautiful home. And I said, boy, this is a beautiful house. You know, interesting, the person, uh, the person treated me very interestingly. He, he, he didn't say anything about it. He, he brought me into the room and he sat me down. He says, you know, he says, I don't care anything about this place. He says, you know what I care about? I care about the Lord. I care about my family. And I care about Christian fellowship. And from that point on, all we talked about was spiritual things. You know, that made an impact on me, okay? Because uh, we're not to be lovers of things, and we're not to be flaunters of things. And when we do that, friends, we have a proud heart. We have a, it's, a, it's a revelation of a proud heart. It really is. And I want you to, I want you to understand something. What do you think that that fella who works as hard as he can and he, he does all that he can do for his family. And he's a godly man. Uh, and he does all, you know, he's just given his back to it or whatever. Perhaps he doesn't have the education you have or whatever. What do you think that he feels when you take him out and show him your Lamborghini? You know? I mean, praise the Lord for what he's given you. And the Bible says he's given you all things richly to enjoy. And please do enjoy. But flaunting it like Hezekiah is a proud heart. A proud heart. Showing it off is a proud heart. Everybody with me? All right, there's one more that I want to show you, the fourth revelation of a proud heart, and that is, are you willing 
Are you willing to take advice? Are you willing to take advice? You notice in your sheet in, in 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse number 1 through 8, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, another king of Israel. For all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake in Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the, the grievous uh, service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which was upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart for yet for three days, and come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men, and stood before Solomon his uh, father, while he, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt uh, be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servant, servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And, then, and basically the point is he forsook wise counsel. He just forsook it. He forsook the author, the earthly author of the book of Proverbs. He forsook Solomon's advice. All right, what's the deal here? This is a man that would not take advice, good advice. Rehoboam, he hears the older men counsel the wisdom. His father, when his father is still alive, you know, I made it hard on the people. I taxed them hard. I worked them hard. And basically he says, uh, he says, he comes back three days later and he says, my father made it hard. I'm going to make it twice as hard on you. That's what he says. Because the young men sa said, the young men uh, that he grew up with said, they're not going to respect you unless you're tough on them. Well, the wise men, the older men said, if you be a servant to those people, a servant leader, they're going to serve you. All right? You know, what's the point of this? You know, folks, we have a very, very proud heart when wise people give us advice and we won't take it. We won't accept it. Uh, you have a proud heart if you're unwilling to be teachable. If you think you know better than everyone else, and let me just say this. Let's back up a little because I'm carefully trying to take this two-edged sword of God's Word and to bring it into everyone's heart. If nobody else's wisdom makes any sense to you except what you think, you have a proud heart. It reveals your proud heart. If you refuse to listen to others when they confront you or seek to help you, it shows something that disgusts God, a proud heart. Some of us are just like Rehoboam and that had to learn his own way, the hard way. What ended up happening is when he sent the, uh, his man to go out and to tax the people, they stoned the guy and rebelled. And it was a violent rebelling against uh, Rehoboam and he fled. You know, it's painfully humorous when you see a teenager who thinks they know more than their experienced parents. Have you ever seen that, experienced that? I worked in a Christian, uh, in, in conjunction with the Christian school where, where we came from. And it's amazing when a 14-year-old a, a girl thinks she knows better than her 45-year-old parents. It's amazing. And, I mean, you, there's not, almost nothing you can do to sway that. I mean, except God showing that. And they, she just, you know, she gets the whole body thing going. She just knows better. But how much are we like that when somebody tries to give us advice, a wise friend or a spouse and a spiritual or a spiritual leader or a co-worker, and we put up the hand and say, I know best. I, I, got, it, I got it covered. I know what I should do. I, this is what I think. That's rough. These are a few revelations of a proud heart. If you go back to our verse, we'll be done. 16.5, the Bible says, everyone, Proverbs, everyone that is a proud uh, is proud in heart, is an abomination to the Lord. Now look at the last part. Though hand join in hand, he, the proud man, shall not be unpunished. What's that last part mean? And we're done. 
Well, those hand join in hand. This is a very specific kind of proud man. This is a proud man who has an agenda, a proud man who evidently has rallied others around him to support his ego and to support his perspective of life. Some of you tell me about the political scenes on your workplace and, and how this happens sometimes of different people who come up against other people, whatever. Uh, this is a guy who, you know, he's right and he gets weaker people around him that support his cause and hand is joining in hand and they all see it the same way, except it's a different way than what God sees it, okay? The Bible says that I don't care if you have tons of people with you. If it's against the Lord and if it's from a proud heart, God's going to punish. He's going to chasten. It doesn't matter how many. I don't know, I forget what the old statement, you know, whatever, 3,000 Frenchmen can't be wrong about the French Revolution, okay? Yes, they can. It doesn't matter how many. A proud heart will not be blessed of the Lord, will not be blessed of the Lord. So as we close tonight, do you have a proud heart? Are you acting as though, as the unsaved do? Will you take a step in sanctification? Do you give glory or credit to your successes, of the successes of your life to the Lord, or do you absorb it? Do you get angry because you don't get the attention or the respect you think you deserve? Do you show off your possessions, and are you willing to take advice? I didn't have time tonight, but... Uh, I, will, I would challenge you to go and to look at a fellow, I believe his name was Ahithophel, and I look at his life. There's another point about advice. Not only uh, are you willing to take advice, but when you give advice and it is rejected, how do you respond? How do you respond? If you give advice and it's rejected, there should be humility, not, I can't believe they didn't do it my way. We don't have time to go into that one, but I hope that we've opened up some things tonight. Let's bow our heads.